What I want to do in the few minutes that I have this morning is to help us uh, touch base on some key uh, principles about working with families and to understand why families and agencies sometimes have difficulty getting on with one another. So we're talking, and the Minister talked this morning about how we help people achieve their own strength, their own power, and empowerment is a, an, an interesting concept. And one of the things that I'm absolutely sure about is that power can only be taken by people. It can't be given to them. So when we're talking about empowering families, we're talking about creating an environment within which those families can take power for themselves. And it's this process of taking the power which is the empowerment we are looking for. We see this today all around the world with indigenous populations who have been dispossessed of their lands and their fisheries and their beaches who today are saying to governments, uh, what you've done to us has, has hurt our people and we are now taking our own back. We are seeking compensation and we are seeking our own power. So people can only take power. It, can, it cannot be forced upon them or it cannot be given by us to them. In child welfare, in child protection, in any, youth, in any service, human service, uh, organisations that relate with families, we have a systems problem. We have a family system on the one hand trying to interact with a professional or agency system on the other. The problem is that these two systems are very different from each other and often they are competing with each other, which makes working together uh, extremely difficult. The professional system, for example, is politically driven. It is very strongly organised and structured. It works on the basis of procedures and manuals and instructions and rules. Uh, everybody in the organisation, theoretically anyway, everybody in the organisation is meant to know their role and what they do and they carry out their job according uh, to that scheme. However, in a family system, things are different, as you know. Each family is unique. Each family is, is, less, is, is, le is less likely to be as structured, so it's a loosely structured um, social uh, construct. Every family has varying levels of what they want to achieve, various understandings about their goals and their aspirations. And every family has its own cultural way, ways of running their family. So they have their own ways of, of doing things, and these don't fit neatly into a common rule book about how families operate. The key message that I want to bring to you here is that these are realities. We have organisational systems, we have family systems, and these systems do not mesh together easily. So we've got to be thinking in systems terms about what happens when a family system like this contacts an agency system like ours. The first thing that happens if we don't make special, if we don't pay special attention to this is that parents and children get caught up in our system. They get caught up in a social work system and often f for them the focus seems to be only on problems and weaknesses. And so they're at a disadvantage and vulnerable all of the time. Remember too that we often are only dealing with parents and children so they don't have around them, while well, they're interacting with this agency system, they don't have around them other people who could be supports to them. Studies show that when we, when we work this way, that parents and children have very little influence over on the nature, the quality or quantity of services they get. And still more that parents and children have little opportunity to articulate, to have a say about what their preferred method of intervention is. I was interested to be in Amsterdam earlier in the week and I hope I don't tread on any toes when I say this, but I was at a conference of, I was on a, at a conference about multi-problem families. And I thought, what a horrible, horrible thing to call a family. 
a multi-problem family. And what we've done is set up in the, in the Netherlands an agency with good intentions to work to bring all of the agencies together who are working with multi-problem families. So what I suggested to them is that we don't have multi-problem families, but we have a multi-problem agency. We need to put the thing put things where they were. But we were talking about how this agency was going to work, and it seems clear that what they want to do is a good thing. They want to establish who should be the lead agency, who should take responsibility for the other agencies when working around a family, so that a family doesn't have 10 or 12 or more workers coming into it, that there would be one lead agency. And they were discussing how they should decide who should be this lead agency. And you know, nobody, I didn't hear anybody say, we should ask the family who should be their lead agency, because they will have a view about this. So parents and children often are not given an opportunity uh, to talk about what they would prefer to happen. And as a result of these sorts of um, uh, responses that we make to parents or the lack of opportunity we give them, then it, it shouldn't surprise us that parents will react to our interventions angrily, with aggression, or, on the other hand, that they just give up and let us, uh, let us do whatever we want to do. And both of these responses are not good. In English, we have the, we have the saying that when an organism is confronted with threat, uh, then it will act in one of two ways. The first uh, way that an organism will react under threat, or one, many people, not say the first way, but many people when they're under threat, will fight. They, they will immediately go into a fight response. Uh, they will challenge the threat and they, will be, uh, they, they won't let the threat overtake them. And so we get behaviours like anger and aggression and contest. So if we're a child protection agency going into a family and saying, we think there is a problem of child protection here, then we should expect with a good deal of our families that we will get this angry, aggressive, conflictual response. The problem is we often see this and we go back to our offices and we say, this family is uncooperative. This family doesn't want to work with us. Uh, this family is impossible to deal with. When really, this family is just scared. Other people don't react with fight, they react with flight. They try to avoid uh, the, the threat and get away from it. And the sorts of behaviours that we get there, as you're well aware, are passivity, giving up, withdrawal, not being available, or just simply handing over the problem to the state or to the state worker and say, you do it. And again, we can come back and we can uh, interpret this behaviour as these people are not interested, or these people, worse, do not care for their children, when in fact what these people are is scared. We also know, of course, that some people freeze, but when the freeze thaws, people will react by and large, in one of these two ways. And we need to expect that, and we need to be prepared uh, to understand that this is a natural response from families. It's not something that we should react to. The, I suppose, to me, the biggest uh, example, the best example of how agencies and family systems think differently is in the way that child protection systems have developed in recent years. Child protection systems have become increasingly risk-focused. And uh, so we get uh, incidents, we get a report to an organisation about harm to a child, and this is interpreted by the organisation as risk. And generally what happens is that the organisation will respond to the risk incident. And sometimes they keep responding to risk incidents to the point where their only alternative is to remove the child out of the situation. This sort of work is harmful because what it doesn't recognise is that risks, incidents themselves, emerge out of patterns of functioning in families. 
So it's very rare for a risk incident to emerge as a one-off event. What we have is a pattern of behaviours in families out of which risky incidents occur. And we call these impacts. Patterns of functioning themselves arise out of the structural issues that affect families. Now what would these be? What are the structural issues that affect families? We have them very much at our fingertips if we're working in this field. We know that poverty, unemployment, lack of income is the biggest structural impact that affects families in our communities today. But there are other things. There is drug and alcohol addiction. There is family criminality. There's domestic violence. There is low educational attainment, poor housing. All of these things are structural impacts. We might call them needs that result in patterns of functioning that result in risk incidents. Now the problem is in our two systems is that often the professional system comes to the family focused on risk. The family group comes to the process focused on need. Families will very quickly say to you, we know why this is happening. What we've got to do is get these people better housing or be, uh, better, you know, better services. We need to provide income for these people. So again, you get a mismatch of perception. The professional system concerned and preoccupied with risk. The family system concerned and preoccupied with need. Now my contention is that seeing risk in the context of need doesn't minimise risk, it sees it properly. It sees risk as it should be properly seen in the context of that family's overall uh, situation. What stops us working differently to this model? Well, social work has been in recent years pushed towards coercion, more and more towards coercion and social control methodologies. In other words, we've been trained to take over. We've been trained to think that we know best. We've been trained to be expert and to take over uh, problem solving and problem resolution in families. This drives out any opportunity that, to, for us to think, let alone to act collaboratively. There can be contests between agencies about what the problems are. Or not only what the problems are, but what agencies, that's your business, not my business. You have to do this, I have to do this. So these problems between agencies can prevent us from having a different approach to families. Often in agencies we move very quickly and unilaterally uh, from problem identification to solution. We too quickly come up with the answers and we work alone ignoring the family system around our parents and children and this is, this is folly. I think the core of the problem is that fundamentally as agencies we've learned not to trust families. Over, over years we've developed a lack of trust uh, for families. When, when we see parents who are um, bad, poor parents, terrible parents, we tend to say, well, that whole family must be bad. So over time, we've lost trust in the fact that, over, that families aren't all bad, that they aren't all problematic, that they're not all in crisis at the same time. But if we believe that, if we believe that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, then we will not look for the grandmother or the uncle or the aunt or the cousin to come around these parents to try and help. We talk ourselves out of working differently too because we say our families are different. What works for those Maoris down in New Zealand won't work here in the Netherlands. I hear, I hear this. Our families are different, you see, but they're not. Because we have research now in this country that shows that your families and our families actually respond to family group conferencing in exactly the same way. And I'll show you the research results shortly. There is no extended family, we say. This, this, this parent, the solo mother, or this mother and father and children are isolated. They don't have any family. They don't want to know any family. If we accept this, 
too readily, then we will not be able to put in place a different way of working. The problems are much too serious. How can we expect families to sort out problems when they're so serious? Surely we are the experts and we must be the ones who solve those problems. So we, 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 we say the, the more serious the problem, the less we should involve the family. And in fact, the answer is the, op the opposite. The more serious the problem the more risk there is that the state will interfere in the life of a family, that's when we should make the most effort to ensure that that family is involved in what happens next. Over 500,000 family group conferences in New Zealand, we've never had anybody killed. And in fact, we've never even had anybody damaged. We've had a couple of fights, and we've had to call the police on two occasions. And that's not bad out of half a million, is it? It takes too long to set up and hold, people say. Well, you know, this is a process that we should use at the beginning of a life of a case. Whenever we have a first contact with a family where we're saying things aren't right here and we need to intervene, this is when we should have a family group conference. Uh, it's not, it takes four to five weeks to set one up. But if we don't do that, then we could spend years and years and years working with this case through the court system and so on. So it's all a question of where you want to spend your time and where that time is most productively spent. Sometimes we get the, we don't want to work differently because mum, dad and the children don't want us to or that it would be harmful for the child. None of these things are true and none of them are supported by research. So, we do need to talk about how we might work differently. That, that model of that, that paradigm that I've just talked about of uh, agencies taking over, agencies being the expert, us being trained to be the problem solvers. How do we, how do we change that and work differently? Always, you see, people like you, agency people like you are criticised for not working well together. I have never yet read a child death report that didn't say that. Every child death report you ever read says, if agencies had worked better together, this child would have been safer. See, if agencies work better, children will be safer. This is not true. We always want agencies to work together, but that won't save children or make them safer. Very rarely do we hear that agencies need to get their act together and work better with families. And my contention to you this morning is that when we come together as agencies and we come around a family, this offers us a way to solve both of these problems. Okay? Because agencies working around a family much more naturally begin to collaborate. The more we can bring agencies face to face with families as they're planning, uh, then the better it is. So we solve the problem of agencies not working together and agencies not working with families by having this one process, which we call a family group conference. In order for this to work, the prerequisite for a new approach to work is, is a broader understanding of what we mean by family. See, par often parents and children in our communities are living in isolation. And, and if, they're, if our parents and children are living in isolation, they are in a dangerous situation. If they're disconnected from their families, disconnected from the community, disconnected from schools and play centres and all of those things, and these families are in the most dangerous situation they can be. They're very, very vulnerable. Isolated or not, these parents and children are nested in a wider family system, even if they don't want to be. We know that those systems exist. Our job, you see, as agencies is not to take over those parents and children, but it's to find the people whom they belong to. We need to go out and find these people and bring them around the troubled part of their family. We need to go and tell them what's happening, explain how they could help, invite them to be partners with us in helping the parents and children in whatever situation follows them. This is how we build a family group. 
They're not, they're not going to exist naturally. We need to go and find these people. And this is why the whole process of family group conferencing invests in the position of a coordinator who does this for us. See, the goal of the family, the goal of all of this is to encourage the family group to take responsibility for planning what sh should happen next and how we make a plan for the future for this child. Why would we do this? If we make the plan for the child, does the family own it? If the family makes the plan for the child, does the family own it? The answer is obvious. So once we've built this family group, we need, then need to position this family group around the, around the parents and the children. We need to position this family group to take control. These people are not powerful. They're still dealing with an agency that's very powerful and families are less powerful. So we need to create an environment and where these two, the agency on the one hand and the family group on the other can have a conversation about what needs to happen next. You understand, I'm sure, the concept of uh, the home and away game. Whenever football teams are playing their leagues, they have a home game one week and then they might play away the next. I don't know whether you know what the statistical advantage of winning is if you play the home game, but in football it's about 75%. So if you're playing the home game three times out of four, you're going to win. And if you're playing the ho away game and three times out of four, you're going to lose. Uh, the, pr the way that we have things organised at the moment, agencies always play the home game. The meetings that they have with families are usually in their offices or in their home, in the family's homes, but on agency terms. The time of the meeting, when it occurs, who's there, who runs it, who's in charge of the process, this all makes it an agency home game. We need to change the rules in our system so that family groups are given the home game. They have the chance to establish their own strength. So family groups will have a say about where the meeting should be, who should be there, uh, what, what will be the process, how long might it take, who would run it? All of these things become then much more likely to contribute to a notion that this is their meeting played under their rules rather than an agency meeting played under home rules. When we do this, when we have this home-led meeting by the family, then professionals need to give family groups the first chance to propose solutions. So professionals provide information and families are given the first chance to propose solutions. So we don't want professionals jumping in there and saying, I think this should happen or I think you should do this. What we want professionals to do is to be very clear about their information, very clear about the nature of their concerns, but leave it to family groups to propose what should happen next. And the reason for this is that responsibility and ownership cannot be compelled Families will only develop responsibility and ownership when they take it for themselves. So these are the outcomes of taking power. What does the FGC look like? Well, this is a busy little chart here. If you just follow the arrows, the direction, the, the, the family group conference model begins with a referral from a social worker or other professional to a person we call the independent coordinator. This person is independent of the case. It, 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 the, the role of the coordinator is to ensure that the agency with the concern and the family group are able to have an equal dialogue, an equal discussion with one another, and that they're not dealing with each other in a different power relationship. The independent coordinator undertakes a process of preparation. This is around about a 30-hour commitment for a coordinator to visit the family, to visit other family members, to talk with the professionals, to understand why a plan needs to be made and what are the nature of the concerns and to prepare people for this meeting. When the meeting begins, uh, family group conference is convened. It has three distinct phrases. 
And this always happens. I want to make it clear to you that this is a managed process. It just doesn't happen uh, by accident. It is a managed process. The coordinator will lead the conference through getting to know each other, of course, but also why are they there? Do they understand why they're there? What is the information we all need to know? Do we all understand why we have a need for a plan? When all of that's clear and families have asked all the questions they want to ask, then everybody who isn't family leaves the meeting. And family members, the family group, and there will be 10, 12, 15, 18 of these people, grandmothers, uncles, aunts, cousins, family friends, neighbours, school teacher, friend, any of these people who become part of the family group, they stay. And they work through all of the information and the, co the coordinator has coached them about how they might consider formulating a plan. And then the third part of the conference, the professionals and the coordinator come back in, rejoin the family, and there's a discussion then, sometimes quite a long discussion about how we can agree this plan and what does this plan need to make it work. As the minister said in his, uh, his speech, nine times out of ten family group conferences agreement is reached at this point and this is absolutely phenomenal. Remember we're dealing with very difficult family systems, often angry, conflictual. Nine times out of ten we will reach agreement with them if we use this process. Each plan also has to include how we monitor, how we know that this plan is working and what we're going to do if it starts not to work. And every plan also ends with a review. So no plan can close unless there's been a review. And usually we review a plan through bringing the meeting back together again. How did it go? Do we need another plan? Or can we now close the plan and the family can manage things from that point onwards? The five key elements of, of the family group conference, first of all, I mentioned all of these, I think. The first is to, to get these five elements clear, there has to be a commitment at state and government level to this independent coordinator. This is a vital aspect of the work. There's no, and there's no way that a social worker can do this because the social worker has to have the conversation with the family. The social worker brings authority and power with her or him. So that conversation cannot happen equally without the presence of a coordinator. There needs to be time and resources to search out the family group, the network. There needs to be private time for the family group because families have information, knowledge, understandings about themselves that we will never have. Then we must give them time in private to talk about those things alongside the things that we know about. The fourth uh, point is really the social contract here. What we're saying to families, if you come to these meetings, if you come in your numbers, if you take, make the effort to come around this household and help, then what we promise you is that your plan, provided that it's safe, it'll be your plan that the agency follows in preference to any other plan. So that's our social contract. Provided that, you, you know, uh, that, that your plan is safe, and we always have to have that bottom line, provided that your plan is safe, it will be your plan that we will follow. So the family plan becomes the agency's plan. And then the fifth point is that agencies who send referrals to family group conferences also have, are obligated uh, to support families implement their plans after a conference. So a plan might be for six months, it might be for a year, families need help from social workers or family workers to support uh, them in implementing their plan. We should never have a family group conference and then leave the family alone. The family group conference is not an event, it's a process over time. So it begins with the meeting and it ends when we have a review and can close the plan. So I want to just, this little picture shows you, go, takes you back to the beginning. I talked about the two, the, the agency system, and the professional system, and this little slide shows you how I think the family group conference can bridge these. So we have on the one hand the professional system, which is structured and organised and rules-based and formal. And on the other hand, we have the family system, which is dynamic and loose 
uh, understandings-based rather than rules-based and informal. And we, uh, to bring these two organisations together, we create the position of the coordinator. And the family group conference then becomes the means for these two systems to talk to one another. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? And the result of that discussion is a collaborative plan that is owned by both the family and the professional system. Thank you very much for listening to me for such patience. <laughs>